Jan Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jan Price Show, all about movies. You're listening to The Jan Price Show, and today my guest is Braden Doomler, and we're discussing his brand new movie, What Lies Below. Welcome to the show, Braden. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. Price, for having me. I'm very excited to be here and to talk about the film. Oh, well, I'm, I'm excited to talk about it, too, because this movie was really got, has many, many aspects in it. Um, so our listening audience knows uh, what, this, what we're going to be talking about. Why don't you give us a brief synopsis of what lies below is all about sure i'll try to keep it spoiler free because uh at the end of the day i feel the film is a mystery so i like to hold yes. it back a little bit uh but the uh the premise is that a, a young girl liberty comes home from summer camp uh she's a little awkward she's not a fully matured yet um to realize that her mom has met a guy and the guy is an absolute adonis of a man um liberty uh 16 years old has her first kind of sexual awakening uh, after meeting him and getting to know him uh and those advances go both ways and they get very awkward and so one night in the middle of the night there's a bright orange light coming from the backyard and liberty wakes up to it to see the man standing on the side of the lake looking at the light and then all of a sudden the man walks towards the light submerges himself under the water and the light clicks off and he disappears. And the rest of the film is, who is this man? Who is John Smith? Exactly. And I find it interesting that you gave him such a common sounding name, too. Yeah. <laughs> that might be a little, there might be a little nod in there to a uh, certain explorer. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, I... I you you said it. Um, the uh, character John Smith is an Adonis. Okay, so all the women. I'm just going to say this right now. You just go watch this movie just to see <laughs> Trey Tucker, if nothing else, because that scene when he's coming out of the water is like woo. Right. <laughs> and so we'll we'll talk a little bit about Trey Tucker because I do want to know more about him too. But I do want to know where the idea because you wrote this as well as directed it, and I want to know where the idea for this uh, came from. Sure. Uh, yeah. So the idea is really a synthesis of two things. Uh, the first was I had this image in my head for a while of this beam of light coming down and hitting a person in the chest in the middle of the woods. And then somebody watching that and seeing it and trying to understand it. Right. And so I started to ask my co like questions like who is the person watching uh, and what is their relationship to that person, to that man? And that's when I thought back on an actual childhood memory. When I was five years old, my first ever crush in my life uh, was actually to my stepmom, uh, Sandy, uh, who's now one of my best friends. But she loves to embarrass strangers all the time about how when I was five years old, I used to go over to her house and she was cooking dinner for me and my dad. I'd run up to her. I'd pull her on the sleeve and I'd go, hey, you should chase me around the, the apartment and try to you know, tickle me. And that's how we first got to know each other is that flirtation uh, and, and my crush. And, and it's so cute and adorable now to look back on. But I thought, what if the roles are reversed? What if Sandy was a man and I was a little five-year-old girl? And then all of a sudden it gets into this gray area of appropriateness. And that was really the impetus of the drama of the story, which synthesized with uh, the image in my head. Interesting. Very interesting. So... The because I don't want to give anything away either because this movie is one of those that um, it unfolds in a in a really interesting way slow a slow way but you've put a lot of different things into this movie that you know let's talk a little bit about because there's a lot of you know it's not just one genre uh, it's multiple genres in in mm -hmm. one film and so let's talk a little bit about that why you. The, because you can't say it's a horror film or a sci-fi film or a family mm -hmm. drama or it, it's a mystery or it's a film about teenage angst. You know, you've got a variety of different things going on in there. So this would appeal to a variety of uh, age groups. I mean, an older teenager, I would say, because she's 16 in the film, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, Liberty is 16 in the film, so. Yes. A sixteen-year-old and above could in definitely enjoy this film. So, why? How? What made you decide to combine all those different genres in this one film? Um, 
You know, I think it kind of stemmed from just following the characters. I'm, I'm very character driven when I write. Uh, I try to figure out their psychology, what their fear is and what drives them. Um, and so when I came up with the character for Michelle, um, who I felt was very broken and had this deep fear of abandonment. And as a result, she's compensated by being this over the top, loving, uh, I'm going to hug you and never let go type of person. Um, and because of my understanding of, of mom daughter relationships, sometimes the daughter pushes away from that. So Libby's kind of the opposite and more composed and introverted. And, and once I started to work on those characters, the drama came out and then everything else kind of filled out from it. Um, I, I would say I, I did get asked once, you know, if I had to pick a genre, like, what is it? Um, and I said, you know, it's a mystery at the end of the day. It's a mystery. Yeah. That's what I would um, say too. That's what I would say right. too. It's a mis- it's a mystery. It, I, you you combine a lot of those other genres, but at the, yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. At the end of the day, it's a mystery. Right, and uh, and I hope that you know one of the fun things is is starting to hear all the fan theories, and and even the people who have positive reviews are still a little bit frustrated by the ending. But mm-hmm. I, I'd, ra- <laughs> I, I'd, I'd rather I'd rather get you thinking. Uh, then and then get you uh, then then have you bored. So uh, my idea of the ending is that that is the who, what, when, where, and why of my mystery. It's all in there. Uh, those last few scenes, that last shot, uh, and then you just if you go back and watch the movie and you start to to rewatch it with that lens, you'll see all the gaps and you'll see why the dialogue is the way it is and why John Smith does it the way it is and why he always has a glass in his hand of water every single scene or he's touching water every single scene and things like that bring on a lot more uh, significance. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's good to know that we, because I also felt a little frustrated with your ending. So I'm <laughs> glad to hear that other people felt the same way, um, yeah. but they have to go back and relook at the film and rewatch it with the ending in mind um, will, would be a very interesting way of uh, watching the film again. Cause sometimes you need to do that. You know, after you watch a movie, you go, gosh, maybe I should watch that again and see what I missed along the way or that, you know. So uh, very interesting. (laughs) Yeah, it's fun. It's, uh, you know, the Easter eggs are throughout and you go back and look for them. I can't wait to hear the fan theories and and see what they do. I don't want to tell anyone because (laughs) I'm much more interested to hear what the theories are. That's so much more fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because you could have set out wanting the film to be one thing and then the fans are going to be and that's true for any piece of art right so we have an intention of um you know when you created this film um that you had a certain um you know something in mind that you thought about this movie and then it's the interpretation of it by everyone else and it is so it's kind of it's interesting and this one because of the way that you've written it uh and directed it um certainly uh allows for that you know for a a really interesting interpretation from your audience rather than so many movies you know just are like in a box you know they're just all sewn up in a perfect little box at the end of it and mm-hmm. uh this one does not do that so that it, that makes it interesting it keeps it interesting and you have the one you know mina suvari playing the mother in this um and i, w- I do want to talk about the casting and emma horvath plays uh liberty yes and, she's fantastic uh, Yes, and me and so mean is it Mina Mena Mina Mina? Uh, it's yeah, Mina Savari. Uh, Savari plays, plays Michelle. Her, who plays yeah. her mother, and then Trey Tucker. So let's talk about the casting. How did you find um, Emma? Because she is the well, they're they're all three characters are very significant to this film, but she sort of Emma really kind of carries the film more with Trey. Uh, so talk about that. How did you find this young actress and? to portray this role. Right. Um, and and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention his scary Velasquez, who has a very small role, but very important one as well. Um, and she's on Saved by the bell these days. So you can check her out there. Uh, but Emma, um, we found her through the casting process. Uh, we got a, a bunch of auditions and, and we got really littered with auditions. Once Mina signed on, I feel like because she's so experienced and knowledgeable and respected, 
uh, her being part of the project really gave it a certification, uh, so to speak, or, you know, a validation. Right. Um, and as right. a result, we, we attracted a lot of talent. Um, and I love finding talent that hasn't gotten their shot yet. Like, cause I mm-hmm. feel like I, I feel that way myself sometimes, you know, like I want, you know, uh, so I, I, we dug into that, that, that pool of, of additions. And I found Emma's tape, uh, Katrina Wendell George, uh, who was our casting director, brought it on to me, who was fantastic throughout the process. And I still remember watching her first audition tape and I'm going, man, there's something really unique about her, but I can't put my finger on it. So I sent it to a friend of mine who used to work as an actor. And he said, yeah, uh, she's got a real Jack Nicholson quality to her. Mm. And I said, what? What does that mean? Wow, <laughs> because, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he responded, well, she's either absolutely crazy or a genius. And it didn't take long for me to be on set to realize it was it was definitely the second. Um, you know, Emma's super cerebral. Uh, she wants all the information. Uh, she wants to know really detailed um, and really understand the character. Uh, um, and then, uh, you know, and we'll talk about things and we'll, we'll kind of figure things out. We'll start uh, things off. But then once she gets in front of the camera and you say action, it just explodes on screen. It's it's amazing to watch. She's truly a mesmerizing captivating uh actor and uh i can't commend her enough oh yeah she's very good how old is she uh she, you know i don't know her actual age she plays a 16 year old in the film and she's uh she is graduated college by now and she's now been cast in lord of the rings uh television series for oh. amazon uh so but I, I i am not aware of uh her actual age so well, she is going to have a long uh, career for sure yep. uh, going forward. So how did you attract Mina Suvari? Uh, yeah, so, so I mean, a, a lot of credit goes to Katrina uh, because uh, Katrina first read the script, the casting director, and, and she loved it. She just connected with it. And so while, you know, other casting directors that we met with set the bar really low on, on talent, uh, she set it really high. And and so she was uh, really convinced we could get somebody great. And 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 Mina, the script came across her desk in her manager's desk, Orin, and they loved it. And Mina met with me and she, you know, grilled me about the script and all the details. And she wanted to know all the secrets, uh, you know, and I told her, you know, what it all means. Um, and uh, she we had a great meeting and afterwards she uh, her manager called up our producer and said, we're in. And uh, that was that, you know, and uh, and I, I'm so thankful for it. I, I, I told Mina very early on in the production process, I said, listen, Mina, you're much more knowledgeable, much more experienced. Uh, you're a pro at this. I'm, I'm a first timer here, so I'm going to lean on you a lot. And like, if you ever need to pull me aside and tell me something, give me a note. Feel free. Like I I, I won't. You know, my feelings will not be hurt. Um, and so as a result, she, she became a real teammate for me throughout the film. And, uh, and I could always rely on her. If I only had one take left, I knew I could still shoot Mina because she would, she would nail it every time, you know? That's great. That's great. And she probably really appreciated the fact that you asked her for, for notes, you know, I mean, that's kind of, Interesting. So I'm sure she appreciated that um, going forward, too. So she and Emma, I mean, they really do look like they could be mother and daughter. They, that yeah. was also, you know, they definitely look like they could be mother and daughter in this. And, and um, we're very good together in this film. Yeah. So, so how did you work on that to get their chemistry down as that mother daughter? Or, or did that come fairly naturally for well, them? Think- I think a lot of the uh, chemistry comes from understanding a path, especially for an actor. They, they, these, these two are such top talents. They're, they're so incredibly talented. Trey, uh, Trey as well. I mean, we, we have to talk about Trey as well. We will. We'll that, talk that, about him next. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. But, but um, that it, 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 all they need is a little bit of a push and then just, you got to let them go, you know? Um, and, and um I, I, so I gave them a lengthy, maybe two, three page backstory and I gave them different backstories, you know, because I always feel that characters have a different perspective on what's happened in their past. And so that was really key to me is giving one for Libby and one for uh, uh, Michelle. And once they read that, they had some questions. We went over them. And when we did the table read, we had some real, uh, you know, discussions about character, about relationship. 
But then once we got on set, I, I just wanted to see what they brought to it. You know, I want to see them do it first and then I'll make the adjustments if I feel it's going off, but they just got it. You know, there wasn't a lot of adjustment needed. They just nailed it every time. Um, and I think they just both responded to the characters really well and they loved the backstory. And I think that helped uh, facilitate that. So they they are they're very good together, and they and it, really you do get the sense of mother and daughter, no question. Okay, so that brings us to Trey Tucker. <laughs> How did you find him? Because he is an Adonis. There's no question he about is. it. I did, and and he's and he's not only an Adonis, he is good in this film. So what? Because uh, sometimes you can really look good and not be a good actor. And uh, yes, and uh, so he he has both of those things going for him. So how did you tell us a little bit about? Um, how you found him and and he's been in other things too so let's talk a little bit about trey yeah trey we were also fortunate to find through the casting uh process and and trey really stood out in the auditions for me um you know obviously i had a high threshold for what the what the actor looked like it was important to me that they were built they looked like they were built to attract women you know? Um, and so, and Trey was and he definitely, definitely tall. Is. <laughs> yeah, he's tall, he's tall, dark, handsome. Um, and he, he's got a great little Southern drawl to his voice, um, which I think he pulls back a little bit, uh, for the role, but it's still, you can hear, he uses it to the, a creep factor instead, which is great. Uh, but the thing I noticed about Trey in the original audition was that he had this incredible ability to expand the material I write it a certain way in my head. And as a writer director, you're so close to the material that you've thought of pretty much everything. Every word has meaning to you. Right. But when somebody takes those words and then changes them a way that you've never thought before, that's not only surprising, but it's exciting. And, and you want that. You want collaborators that are going to elevate your material uh, and not just read it, you know? Exactly. And, and so... Uh, I was so excited by that. I mean, I didn't agree with all the dis the decisions and we worked on all that, you know, but I love that he had ideas like that. And I love that he was, he could do it 15 different ways and make the subtlest line creepy um, or, and the mo most uh, basic action dynamic uh, or do it the opposite, you know? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I love that. And he also had this great control. I noticed cause I could, adjust him on the spot and he adjust the auditions and he had no problem. And I knew how important that was because when I sent out the rough draft of the script, I would get an entire spectrum of reactions for some of the most more subtle moments. For instance, when John grabs Libby's shoulder while hugging Michelle and he kind of rubs it. When I read, when people read that uh, in the original script, some of them said, Oh, he's horrible. He's an awful person. It's all over. Others didn't even notice it, you know, and we had that kind of a range. So I knew that I needed to be able to, in the edit, dial in how creepy that was. And so on set, what we would do is we would actually create a barometer of like one, three, five, six, seven, and he would do it creepier and creepier, creepier, or less and less creepy each time. So that once we got to the edit and we started to get audience feedback, we were able to really focus it in exactly what, what the pitch needed to be. Mm -hmm. And we did that throughout the film for many different things. And I think that helps keep the audience right at the spot where we want them, not too ahead, not behind, right there, you know? Mm -hmm. it, yeah, yeah, it definitely does. Well, he, you know, he, he was a great choice. Nice to hear he's a good collaborator, too. Where did you film this? We uh, shot upstate New York in the Adirondacks, uh, one of the biggest natural land reserves in the entire uh, North America. It's, it's really un, undervalued gem up there, uh, near Lake George, uh, and, uh, oh, yeah. Bolton landing. Okay. Yeah. I, I, well, I'm from the East coast and I've visited the Antarctic many times. So, uh, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up going there for summer camp. So I was really excited to shoot up there. Oh, so you're very familiar with the area for sure. So tell me about the cinematography and the lighting in this film, because that is really significant. Uh, well, it, it's almost another character in a way, but to so tell us a little bit about that. I'm glad you feel that way because that was the intention. Um, the 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 unique lighting, the the really bold colors are supposed to represent John Smith in a way. And so while the the, the film starts off looking like a Hallmark movie, 
uh, you know, saturated colors, just everything bright and poppy and a little bit of uh, a warm tint to it. Um, over the course of the film, those colors desaturate and those unique colors, those cyans, those ambers, those, those colors that aren't necessarily normal uh, come in. Uh, just the way John Smith comes in. Um, and that was the discussion I had with Jimmy uh, Jun Liu, who was the cinematographer. And Jimmy is like my brother from another mother. We've been working together forever since uh, we actually shot one of Ryan Coogler's short film back in the day together. Um, and we have a great collaboration and he understood what I was trying to do. And he was always trying to just elevate it, just take it another step. And and that's an, a grand and great uh, collaboration because while I'd be, I'm pretty hands-on as a director, I know what the shots are, I know what the colors are. Uh, and Jimmy respects that. Um, and so what he does is he finds other, he finds the details to shine in. And so Jimmy throughout the film is communicating in like the simplest ways, like the eye lights in John, they're different in every scene. And there's meaning to that, you know, for Jimmy. And I, I find that fantastic, like to be able to do that at our budget level, uh, Jimmy is just truly gifted. Well, it's, you know, that's, again, it's almost like another character, you know, the lighting, the way you did the lighting in this. So, and also the score. The score is also uh, also very good and works so well with it. Who, um, tell, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your, com- your composer on this. Yeah, uh, Gavin Keyes. Uh, I've been working with him for a very long time. One thing I learned about this uh, industry is that once you find people that you work with well, you never let them go. You know, <laughs> and uh, and Gavin's been amazing. We've worked to get on two shorts and now this feature. Um, and when one of the early conversations I had with Gavin, I go, Gavin, you know, we're we're making a sci-fi movie. Go ahead and lean into like you can make up sounds. You can create an entire different landscape because these can be unnatural. They don't have to be normal. And uh, uh, Gavin really took that and ran with it. He was uh, he bought an underground uh, underwater microphone and was recording sounds like cymbals crashing and marbles rolling down a bathtub in the in the in the bathroom of his little apartment, uh, getting these really un- unusual and eerie sounds that he then turned into instruments, basically through his um, you know digital setup, whatever he's got, and. I mean, it was just fantastic to watch as it came together because usually I have like an incline of what the sound is and I kind of give it, give it a little bit. Um, and then Gavin just goes crazy with it. And he really did. It, it's fantastic. Oh, it is. It is. Again, you know, it, I mean, the, to me, the music is so important to a film and um, the score. And this definitely, uh, it was, it was different. And you did, you know, it, it underscored what was going on. And it, you know, really added uh, to the mood of the film. Where can people um, see this film, What Lies Below? It's on... Uh, all digital platforms, a ton of digital platforms, uh, this, uh, Friday, December 4th, starting, um, you can check it out on iTunes. You can look at, you can rent it on Amazon. You have to look for it in the in theaters now section because there's a small theatric release as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I appreciate all the support. Uh, you know, it's my first feature, so I'm horribly nervous, but, uh, also <laughs> incredibly, incredibly excited. So we'll see how it goes. Oh, you should be, you're giving birth. <laughs> you're yeah. giving birth. This is your baby. Uh, yeah. so yeah, I, I do recommend everybody, you know, especially the women. Okay. Women, I'm just going to say it again. You got to go watch this movie just to see Trey Tucker as the Adonis in that opening scene. It's pretty, uh, and, 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 and it has that underlying sexual tension throughout this movie, too. So that's all fascinating how you've interwoven that throughout this movie. Um, so I, I wish you much success. Uh, oh, thank and you. I look for, you're welcome. And I look forward to having you back on the show again, Brad. And so good luck with everything. I'd love to come back. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Yes, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. You can listen to the Jan. Bye bye. You can listen to the Jam Price Show whenever, wherever at the Jam Price Show. Dot com and on the iHeart Podcast Network, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, YouTube, my YouTube channel. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at The Jam Price Show. And you can go to The Jam Price Show on Facebook and please like it while you're there. Thank you all for listening. Jam Price talks to the movers and shakers in the film business. The Jam Price Show, all about movies. 